Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Going Rogue Gaming Podcast, a podcast where we gather around the uh, the cornucopia of roguelike games uh, to to talk about uh, all of their various flavors and cranberry sauces and other assorted uh, delicacies that that we may be uh, encountering on our on our journey to see what the the top. 100-ish roguelikes over the past 10-ish years look like. Uh, ha- happy Grog's Giving, everyone. We're uh, we're recording this just a couple days before Thanksgiving. Uh, and we're going to be stuffing a whole lot of games into this episode, <laughs> including a couple of real turkeys, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Indeed. Sorry, I'll stop now. No, this, <laughs> we, we need more of this. We need more turkey related uh puns and mayhem as the uh as the show goes on um but yeah this uh we got another bundle episode here today uh we we as we're going through this process you know we have a lot of games that have very um low amounts of i guess playtime commitment you could say where you could see really what all of the game has to offer in a short amount of time so it makes sense for us to kind of bundle these all all together and our bundles today is uh, combining, uh, continuing along with our journey through uh, the year of 2012 roguelike games. And we're talking uh, the games Cargo Commander, Realm of the Mad God, and Din's Curse. Have uh, had any of you heard of any of these games before we, we played these for this session? Absolutely Negative, not. no. I think... Uh, I think... I had tried playing Realm of the Mad God ages ago when it first came out in the pre-Steam era, back like back in college era. But yeah, I, I feel like it, that one's the most like the one I am most likely to have heard of. It, mm-hmm. it seems like it's still going. Like there, there, there was were, an update when I played it again today. So yeah, yeah like people again. were running around in that game. So there are other people actively playing it now. Uh, which I don't know if that's going to be necessarily true for all of the games that we play. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting to see how how long lived some of these older games because we're talking 2012. This is a decade ago from when we're recording 2022. Uh, I'm sure if someone's listening to this in the year 2030 or 2040, they'll be like, "Oh my god, it's still going on." But uh, but yeah, I I seem to recall playing that one and you know, bouncing off of it at the time and then being surprised that it shot back up on this list again. uh, Be like, okay, maybe, yeah, we'll we'll get into it in a second. But uh, but yeah, it was kind of, I think that was the only one of the three that I had had heard of. So I was interested to delve into the other two. Um, But maybe maybe let's start first with uh, the one I have here in the Google Doc, uh, Cargo Commander. Uh, this is a game that was released uh, November 1st, 2012 uh, for Mac, Windows, and Linux. This pulls in at uh, the 412th most popular roguelike on Steam with about 870-ish total reviews and cranking in at the 88th percentile of the distribution. This is this is a very interesting game, uh, and I don't know that I've really played anything kind of like this in terms of um its gameplay mechanics and style but this is if we had to describe it uh auditory medium again um but imagine like mario with gravity going all sorts of different directions and cargo containers making making up the level that you're running around in but with also collapsing into a black hole at the end of every uh every stage uh yep. and some aliens kind of <laughs> yeah there's a uh, like all good mario games you have uh i think they're mutants is what the game lists them as but you know you you have a uh, like all good mario games you have mutants and shotguns and and black holes and and baseball caps so uh cargo commander comes to us from being published by missing link games which 
as I'm doing research for these things, I'm always kind of surprised to see like what other things these like publishers and developers have worked on. Uh, Missing Link Games, you might know from, uh, I, I've heard the name Velvet Assassin. And I don't think I've played that game before, but you may have also heard of the game Spec Ops The Line uh, that they have yeah. co-published with 2K Games. I'm, just, I'm sure you've heard of 2K Games, but I was kind of surprised like going through the, uh, the, the rabbit hole. I'm like, oh my God, Spec Ops definitely heard of that one this seems kind of odd that like they went from almost directly cargo commander to spec ops yeah that's like a very different genre of game uh just shooter straight regular shooter mm -hmm. but yeah i mean that could be like that's the one to pay the bills <clears throat> and this is the one that they were doing like they wanted to like flex their weird muscles this may also have been, uh, I would guess, a buyout situation because any, I think the uh, the Missing Link uh, games publisher was very apt because trying to find any info on them was also conspicuously missing. So hunting down how they went from this very teeny tiny two-person indie game uh, publishing, uh, we'll talk about the development in a minute, to something as enigmatic as uh, as Spec Ops is is kind of a jump, but I I would have to imagine, uh, and you know if you're the uh, if you're the uh, game director of Spec Ops, I know you're listening right into the show. Uh, let us know how that process worked, but uh, it had to have been a situation where they were helping to publish it initially, and then 2K must have bought them out as a, the process went along. That's the only way that I could see it going. That would make sense. But this was this was a game that was developed by uh, Serious Brew Games, uh, a two-man indie game company uh, headquartered in the Netherlands with Martin Brower, the coder slash designer, and Daniel Ernst, the, uh, the artist for them. Uh, they both had left Triumph Studios where they had developed the Overlord games. Uh, you're kind of standard hacking. I think they're like hacking slash action adventure games for the Xbox. Um the idea for Cargo Commander the devs uh, had gotten was when they were trying to come up with a concept for a game that could be done in their spare time during their normal uh, normal working hours, during their normal job. And it's interesting that the development behind this game really reflects a kind of, I mean, it takes place in space and there's wormholes and all that, but there's a, a kind of acute um, homage to, to working class uh, um status in this a little bit uh the developers go on in an interview to say that uh their dad had worked in a factory where he would work long hours uh, it wasn't a place where you would bring children it probably wasn't a very healthy place uh to work in uh there were multiple signs with the descriptions of how you could be disfigured or killed by machinery and uh, it felt completely alien to them um when they started working on the game uh their dad had worked uh, at his job for 40 years and then he busted his knee which forced him to do mind-numbing work until his pension kicked in this served as the core concept for the story and some of its gameplay. The repetitive nature of the work, uh, Cargo Commander as a man of few words, uh, unless he's cursing, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Cargo Corp, uh, the, the corporation, the game, exploiting their employees, all that good stuff. The home container that you start off in being, and, and like all the isolated spaces with their own theme and so on. Um, an important theme for this game is uh, going home. There's lots of little homages to uh, getting letters from family and like little postcards that you pick up from from your kid, um, and those found it found its way into this game through a lot of the design. Uh, the further so in this in this game, you start off in kind of like a central central zone, and big shipping containers slap into the side of it and your goal is to kind of explore out into those containers. And the there's a really great um, background tune that plays in your sort of home home spot. Uh, I think that's my, the favorite part of the game for me is that little, like when you, when you get into your home area and that little music the track plays, like, yep, that's good. Everything else, well, I mean, to each their own. It reminded me a lot of Outer Wilds exactly it did, it did have that it had that that sort of feel to it too, yeah exactly you're like you're, you're coming back to your little pod um but well, and well, the, yeah, well yeah and and the further that you get away from your home pod that music diminishes a lot so it, it makes you feel very isolated uh the developers say in in this interview that um the composer misha velthuy velthuy 
<laughs> Misha Velthuyas, uh, the title track is Homesick Blues, um, would sound more quiet the, the further you are away. And it just has like this very kind of homey, folksy uh, kind of, kind of uh, feel to it. Um, the, the game originally started off as kind of like a more straightforward platformer, and then it became more of a, of a roguelike as the game designed, um, as the game design progressed. Uh, the developers kind of went back and forth between two sort of uh, key key sort of um, design choices. One being the kind of main one that you run through with the quote unquote story mode, and then the other one being sort of like an endless version where you you start in your home container and then you venture out, and then like everything behind you is constantly like building up on it. So it's kind of like an endless mode in a way. Um, uh, but yeah, let's let's kind of uh, jump into it. The story behind this is that uh, you are the eponymous cargo commander, and Cargo Corp has sent you uh, out to ride the <laughs> raise through the ranks of the corporate ladder uh, by doing so in a shipping container flying through space. Uh, in this shipping container, you have all sorts of different uh, different things to interact with. Um, but your your main thing that you hit is a giant magnet that attracts huge shipping containers from other parts of space that slam into your main kind of home shipping container. And your goal is to go through these shipping containers, explore and pick up little little cargo um, things that give you uh, points that you can exchange for stuff later. Um, and the you survive like waves of these uh, cargo containers slamming into each other kind of like building out into this uh this network um where when each like cargo container slams into another one it breaks pieces off and that's how you kind of maneuver your way through this whole system um but after a certain amount of time like all good cargo containers through space a black hole opens up and oh shit you gotta get back to your home container i think it's technically a wormhole yes you're right it is a wormhole how could i get that so wrong wow <laughs> how could scott's <laughs> Just, the right. astrophysicist burger get it wrong wow yeah Incredible. breaks them up uh yeah i i that was one of the the level of envi of environmental damage and non three-dimensionality of it was one of the things that i actually did like about this game i like that when they the the cargo ships you know containers they flew in and they like broke off a corner of your ship and that was how you got out to go get them and then as you got into the other ship or like the containers gravity would switch directions to a, a randomly oriented uh down direction um that yeah. was yeah i felt like it had the the seed of a good idea of an interesting <laughs> idea yeah but kind of like inception sort of like you know the the gravity you know gravity is shifting as you're going everywhere and uh that was the novel thing to it and that was in my view the only novel thing to it but again it sounds like i think scott you you, you actually really love this game is that right um yeah i think mm -hmm. of of the three that we played today i think i liked this one the best um at, i think like yeah, the thing that really hooked me at first was this kind of non-linearity to it. It's like doubly so with, you know, moving from one container to the next and having like the whole gravity perspective shift and flip upside down. It can be like super disorienting the first time that you play it. And you're like, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Um, but I, I I really like that, that aspect of, um, I almost think of it in like a super Metroid sense of like, you know, you're, you're maneuvering through this labyrinth and then, you know, oh, it's self-destructing and you got to get back to the home starting zone. Like that, that kind of like really hooked me pretty well. But I think that there's, there's like a lot of um, tension that builds up because one of the, the main goals in this is high score chasing, uh, like all good roguelikes. And as you progress through a, um, I guess so when you when you start up the game you're you're given a little tutorial that kind of gives you the shakedown of how this game plays out and then you eventually graduate to to picking what sort of sector that you that you want to do and these are basically like picking what seeds that you want to to have the game 
actually generate all the cargo containers flying at you and stuff. And there's a bunch of them that are uh, preset. Like here are the most popular ones that people have already done. Here are ones that uh, that your friends have actually set up. Um, and you can actually just like type in a sector name manually and just you know run one repeatedly yourself. Uh, I ran the the grog pod sector maybe like five or six times in an, in an attempt to see like a what happens when you get to the top of the link uh, leaderboard, and b like how fun is it to just like run the same one over and over. I did do a bunch of the other ones, but like the high score chasing nature of it made it so that as you're progressing through like the game will get like a, a round of this will get progressively harder and harder and you'll encounter more and more enemies and you see that little high score going up in the corner and it, it shows you relative to like the next closest person on the leaderboard and you're like oh my god i gotta beat that guy so bad and you're off by like 50 points or something i felt so that you, to be especially motivating so if you play the same seed twice in a row is it exactly the same in terms it of is like where the 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 cargo pods are that coming in and like what kind of stuff they have in them. I'm I'm 99% sure that it is, but I think that like the the nature of where so like the the cargo containers come in and like slam into your your like home zone, right? But like it's not it's not like one slams in the top right and then another one slams to the top right. One can slam into the top right and then one can another one can slam into the bottom left. So it can, it is technically the same seated run, but if so you like choose the containers are the same, but the yeah, yeah, and like, from... but like your time limit is such that you don't have a whole lot of time to just like see the entire thing all in one go. So it's like one branch opens up in the top right, another branch opens up in the top left. I did uh, the grog pod seed, you know, several times. I was like, okay. I know that the first container is going to come from the top right. And then like later on, there was like multiple, mul like multiple paths to explore. You just don't have enough time to see it all. So in one run, yeah, you could be like, okay, I know it's going to come from this direction. I'm going to go this other direction instead. And having like technically the same seated experience, but a different way of playing it was very interesting. Another major component of this game is like when everything, when shit's hitting the fan and you gotta like get back to your home container before the wormhole eats everything. That's like the panic mode of like, so your, your cargo commander that you're running around, you have a, a big like robot fist that's also a drill that you can drill through holes in the wall or drill walls down so that you can go through space. Another fun element of this that I thought was like, there's no sound in the game when you're out in space. I thought that was a nice little addition uh, added to the uh, to the tension and the creepiness factor, I felt. Um, but like everything's going to shit. You're like, you're burning, you're like drilling through a wall and you're like, oh, I need to get, like you're flying through space and you're running out of oxygen. You like, oh my God, I'm going to suffocate. And then you drill through another wall to like come back in just for a second, just to get a breath of air. And then you finally get back home and you're like, huh. oh. like, that I felt was was pretty entertaining. And I think that went a long way for for making the game repeatedly fun for me. No. So I'm gonna Underwater. give <laughs> I'm gonna give I'm gonna give an uh, 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 an analogy for what I think this game is. I think this game is a sandwich that has excellent bread on the outside. So like the beginning is a cool like concept. That tension of getting back is interesting. Some of the replayability of like chasing stuff is interesting, but then you open up, there's that black box of what is in these cargo containers. And then you open up your sandwich and there's just like a single piece of bologna. And then you see a whole line of sandwiches coming and each one has just a single piece of sad bologna inside. Um, I just didn't find the, the actual cargo part on the inside of the, of the of the box is that interesting the things that you're picking up were just generic items that i mean they changed once you pick them up but it's like eh, it's just a thing um and like there wasn't really variation in in the layout of these things i, I felt like once you had done a couple of these cargo boxes you basically had seen all of them and you could optimize like how you're running around but you weren't like the what the novelty ran out almost immediately and it was just like optimization mm -hmm. 
Um, and like uh, maybe I didn't get far enough into the game. Maybe more stuff happened later. I know that there's the whole upgrade system that I didn't really interact with that much. So maybe at a certain point, like in the much later cargo cargo pods that come in, maybe stuff gets more intense. But I didn't get the hook to get towards that point. Yeah, I think you're being generous by even saying that there's a slice of bologna there, because um, this is a shit sandwich, um, <laughs> except for the outside, uh, both sides, outside sides of this are also made of shit. It's just shit on shit here, um, in my opinion, cool. because, and, and, and the reason here is, uh, it's an underwater simulator, and there, with very few exceptions, I don't find that mechanic, the one that you were just talking about, the you have so much air and you have to get to a place before you start taking damage. Like that mechanic is, is, is just, a, it's just a, hey, here's a stress inducer where mm -hmm. you're not really sure if you're going to make it to the other side. Like you're, you're going underwater and you don't know where the, you don't know if you're going to make it out at the other end. Like this is the, can you figure out, navigate the tunnel essentially to get another breath of air. And um, as, as kind of like the, one of the mechanics of this game, but I just... Subnautica is the only game I think that does that well. Hmm. And um, there's a, many reasons why that, there's, the whole game is built around that mechanic. Whereas this game, this that's just the, how you get around into these little shit boxes where <laughs> you're like, bam, 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 here's some nails. And I'm going to shoot this dude and pick up a generic box and do this over and over and over and over again. And um, yeah, the, the, I, it, you're talking about Mario. It's It's Mario, but like without like the feeling of, really purpose like you're not saving the princess you're kind of maybe someday you'll get home is the 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 kind of the underlying uh, narrative and it's just like that's not compelling let me i make me make i want to make progress towards saving the universe give me a better arch than just i might get home if i satisfy my corporate overlords or like working for me. even like story journals or something like why are all these cargo things out here like i want i, they, I mean they have the emails they they do have some of that, but it's just like that didn't. Do, I don't want to read. Emails. I don't want to have to I read. Wanna, a, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, but no, no. I, I'm more than okay. Yeah, you reading do. You stuff. do that. I love yeah. reading things in games, but I don't want to read them in email form. I do that all day already. I want to read them in weird journal pages that I find in the ship and mm -hmm. like tracking down and be like, oh no, if I don't get that journal, I might not know what's going on. Wait a minute. Let, let me just the sidetrack just a moment here. Like, do you read the Skyrim books, the Oblivion books in the game? Like, do you go through like the lore of the? Well, I mean, I read all of the Marwin books, and they reuse them throughout the Elder Scrolls. So, <laughs> I mean, I de I definitely well, do go. have a PDF on my computer of the what was it like the thirty six sermons of Vivek? Yeah, you are a different gamer than I am in that <laughs> regard. <laughs> I collected all the books in Marwin. I stored them in my house so that I could read them later. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. I did not Colin, know that about you, Colin. Colin, have you did you uh ever go down the route of like printing out all of the all the Elder Scrolls like books from the game in actual physical book form? There was a thing that like you could actually get like a, a physical ordered no, version of that. No, because this was in like early high school. I would have had to like print them off on like my parents' printer in color. And that wouldn't have they would just be like, What on earth are you doing? Stop printing these. The toner, yeah. Colin. It's the most expensive liquid on earth. Ink for printers. Um, but yeah, no. If they had, if they'd given me some sort of uh, external story hook to to chase down, I mean, I don't know if that would have been enough, but it at least would have given me something to like look for. In some sense, like the corporate grinding, like maybe is too like on brand for this game, where like. Yeah, if, if if your if your call to action is corporate grinding, like I think yeah. we're we're all maybe a little too familiar with that already and hitting too close to home. So like the idea of like, oh, I can't wait to like get out of my corporate grinding job to play a game about corporate grinding. Uh, yeah. If there I was some find something that's like, uh, you know, here's a way to eke out some sort of like interest in your job. Uh, that's outside of the bounds, like. I'm sticking it to the corporation because I'm also reading journals on the job. Like, okay, I'm still, still very, uh, uh, hits maybe too close to home, but, uh, 
Yeah, if if the if the goal of the game, just to like just to, as a spitballing an idea here, the goal of the game is that you're accumulating these this this is cargo to form the explosive because what you intend to do is to like just crash into the 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 homeland of the corporate like entity and destroy Ooh, yeah. them once and for all. Suddenly, I'm like. I get to destroy this corp. I need to keep fighting because I want to like keep collecting the explosives so I can kill all the corporate over. Like that sounds or, the fight club approach. Or exactly. to like build a sustainable spaceship so you could escape from the grind. Not just right. Right. Like going well, you, 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 home you, to you your can't family. just affect yourself. You have to like affect. Uh, I mean, like the you have you have to, you have to be able to affect you not just yourself, your family, your community, but you have to be able to save. I mean, saving the world, saving the universe is the grandest scale. But like, you really want to be on the upper echelons for most of these kind of games, right? I mean, Stardew Valley did save your community, which is like yeah. a compelling hook. But I think you got to start with something around that. Yeah, The Sims yeah, save your community, build, save mean, your family. I feel like there's yeah. a lot of games that that eventually like do something like that, where it's like, okay, scavenge a bunch of things and you can build your town. Okay, that could have been four, okay. Yeah, exactly. You're like Unity. you know you're i want to be i want to skim off the court the top of the corporation like see how many see how many i can uh of these like bounties that i'm collecting on this ship how many how many can i skim off and uh give to like the, the kid <laughs> in the like space slum uh yeah and like yeah. why why are the mutants your enemy if like yeah i don't know i, I feel like there's there's i i will give the game credit there is a lot of kind of like that um corporate like tone deafness in a lot of the emails that they send but like yeah i think it, it all kind of builds into the sort of aloofness like you know your character is not super important in the grand scheme of things and your call to action of like i'm just gonna grind up through the corporate ranks in order to go home like it i think it works here but i don't think it's maybe as compelling as something as like a world ending cataclysmic event that will really like drive the player to action yeah, it's not enough to hook me into like if the gameplay itself was riveting, Much then better. it would be fine. But it's not enough in and of itself to drive me to play a game that I'm or uh, that to a gameplay situation where I was like, eh, this isn't really that. It's not really doing it for me. Yeah, like, I didn't hate it. I just didn't love it. I could play other games instead. Rankings and score. Should we? I mean, I feel like we got two more games to get to here. Yeah, oh, yeah, let's uh let's jump into our next game, uh Realm of the Mad God. Uh this uh was released February 20th, 2012 on Steam and you can find it on well it's uh, available for Windows and Mac but mostly just on Steam but um this <laughs> this uh game eye-bogglingly uh popular uh this comes in at the 19th most popular roguelike in all of the 5000 that we have available in our massive data set with something like 42,000 total reviews to it, uh, unsurprisingly the 99th percentile of that distribution. Wow. Uh, this is a, a much different kind of game than what we just sort of described with Cargo Commander, where I would I would describe this as kind of like a, a well, it's, an, it's a, an MMO, but it's a top-down 2D MMO bullet hell confetti fest, I guess is how I would describe it. Very good description. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about the development history. Uh, this, I think, was a little bit of a hot potato. Um, this was a, a game that was originally created by Alex Carabas and Rob Schillingsberg, founders of Wild Shadow Studios in Los Altos, California. Uh, they developed this for the indie game forum TIG Sources uh, assembly competition, quote unquote. Uh, they developed that for the competition 2000, in October 2009. Uh, with the strict criteria of limiting the competitors to a very small sample of art resources. Uh, I think you can kind of get that even with the game's current state now. Um, but the aim of uh, the game at the time by these developers was to shake things up by breaking as many MMO rules as they could. Um, do you guys have much MMO experience? I think RuneScape was my was the largest mmo that i ever did i, I world war or uh, world of warcraft i didn't i really get into because it just didn't feel good after like i was older at the time runescape is the only thing i could do when i was young because poor and my <laughs> computer couldn't run it so it's just like oh yeah online but like uh um yeah uh I, so i say very limited i played runescape i did play wow but not not enough to say that i was actually into it 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we're I tried, similar in that regard. I tried to play Eve, but oh, right, I decided did, did. that instead <laughs> I would just read stories about Eve because that's really what I want. Um, yeah, another game where uh, you you look at enough Excel spreadsheets a day. Yeah, what's well, the thing watch... is like, well, Sorry. I mean, like with, with Factory, like we're all like building data pipelines and like, or Scott, you and I are anyways. And like, it's like, yep. And Factorio is like, you're, you're I'm designing literally this. building the pipeline. Right. And data. like, <laughs> you can go, you can come home from your job and get into Factorio and be like, I'm, this is still, this is crack. Uh, this yep. is perfect. So I don't know if that holds that like, it has to be different than your day job to be entertaining. It definitely has to be a power fantasy though. Um, but this is unrelated to the mad God. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> for MMO, me, I th- yeah. For me, I, I, I think, think. Sorry. Go ahead. My uh, my only MMO experience, I guess, if you if if you could count Destiny Two as an MMO, that's sort of like on the periphery. I don't think I really ever got in. Oh, MMOs. I know the one. Planet Side. Oh, Planet Side. <laughs> uh, see, but, but those... it's not an MMORPG. I think it actually is in some ways more relevant to this kind of game, though, because. Oh yeah, that's you're... a good point. Like, this is a game where you, like, I didn't really interact with the multiplayer nature of it. Oh, you missed out then. I for Planet Side or for Realm of the Mad God? Realm of the Mad God. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, like, I saw that there were people around, and I immediately died when I tried to go into a boss area that had people fighting stuff, even though I was at level 20 and did have decently good gear um but like i feel like that's why people like this game is it's the 8-bit mmo Mm -hmm. and like that that has a like mmos intrinsically have appeal to people yeah Uh, community thing i mean uh, i know we have gotten into not mmos but we've done weird community-based things h1z1 where we just are like you know persistent worlds uh community interaction stuff like there is a human appeal to that Mm -hmm. um but i think that you can you can find it wherever you want if there's (laughs) a game that allows it and i think that uh i would prefer to look somewhere else for the most part uh that being said i don't think i dislike this game as much as you guys did like it was hate it. no i didn't i didn't hate it at all i just think it was too, too too simplistic yeah um yeah yeah let's 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 come back maybe a little bit to the to the uh development here uh because i think that'll that might also shed some light on its development uh like principles and background but uh in let's see uh january 2010 uh this game came out as a beta release uh june 2011 uh seattle-based game developer spry fox uh helped uh come in and provide some some uh assistance to help get this to a full release this came out as we said at the top uh february 2012 uh out on steam um june 2012 the game was then reacquired by uh kabam which is based up in vancouver british columbia uh which is more known for sort of facebook games uh i guess notably kingdoms of camelot this sort of falls into the category of like games that i've never heard of but somehow have like 50 million players across the planet i'm like shrug uh december 2012 uh the not six months later uh the game decided to or the uh camel or bah, this is gonna be a fun one to edit uh <laughs> december 2012 uh not six months later kabam decided to implement free-to-play microtransactions everyone's favorite uh i think reading through uh the forum postings at the time uh people were a little dismayed and i guess skeptical of is this the right decision to go with um i don't remember if i paid for realm of the mad god way back in the day when i was first trying it like in the beta stage uh if so it was probably in that kind of like uh bargain bin like three to five dollar range i would guess um but i don't remember it being a kind of crazy microtransaction mania fest that we see today um Afterwards, uh, Wild Shadow Shadow co-founders had both left to pursue other opportunities. Um, Other people sort of stayed on to help with the transition. Uh, 
The Seattle-based uh, Spry, Spry Fox developer went on to develop Steambird's Alliance as a spiritual successor to Realm of the Mad God, and you can kind of see that influence with, with their game. Uh, four years later, in June 2016, uh, Realm of the Mad God was sold to Deka Games, D-E-C-A, uh, and four years later, they wound up developing a, a Unity-based version of the game uh, where we get the Realm of the Mad God Exalt from, this is the, the Unity uh, version. Before, it had been largely Flash-based, which I guess you could also see from its uh, game design, but um, mm -hmm. Deka's website interestingly has a, a marketing strategy uh, post on there about how they doubled uh, active users in the game, which I was admittedly a little skeptical with this because I think I, I this is a game where I'm I'm trying to walk a very neutral line with it because I I think this is a game that's not for me. I think the style of game is not for me, and I think like the hot potato nature of it being transferred from like entertainment like monolith to entertainment mon monolith also sort of doesn't sort of sit right with me. So I walked into this uh, blog post that they had with like. Um, you know, puffed chest, like, oh, well, you know, what sort of marketing babble are they going to send, you know, our way here? But I think they actually wound up doing a pretty smart play here because what they wound up doing was like the game wasn't, was kind of like, you know, dying as, you know, most of these sort of MMO style games do, but their marketing strategy was to, <laughs> shocker, engage people where they are and, like go out and reach out to people on the realm of the mad god subreddit and like go go to where the the communities are and engage people there and i think they they wound up um putting out a, a lot of like new updates and uh timed release monthly content to get people actively engaged and uh, apparently it worked uh this game is still going strong as far as i can tell uh you know it's it's the top 20th most popular roguelike, I guess, for a reason, uh, you know, maybe free to play being, being one of them, but, um, but yeah, I was actually kind of surprised to, to see them having a more sort of nuanced approach with their marketing strategy than maybe just something like, uh, you know, FOMO based things and like really, really grinding people to the core. But, um, yeah, I guess like, the first thing that you see in this game that sort of put me off from it outside of the tutorial that you complete is the sort of home base zone. Wait, first, before we get into there, yes. uh, fun fact, you can accidentally quit out of the tutorial by clicking the home base button, and it will not let you go back into the tutorial, and it will be very confusing. <laughs> I was like, I missed so much there. And I was like, I don't, I just ran around. I'm like, I don't know how to get to like quests. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but yeah, is, especially if you don't know what you're doing, if you go into that home base area, it is, uh, there is a lot there. Uh, yeah, the Nexus is a quite the uh, complex uh, situation. Yeah. I mean, I imagine it's, so there's the Nexus, which is the central hub of all of the things. And that is, your home base it is it is as if you were in all of the different cities combined and smashed into one city all of it is in the one spot all of the item buying all of the uh your your personal storage your quest uh givers um so it is a little overwhelming for a new player uh who skipped half of the tutorial, but I imagine also <laughs> for anyone, really. It's just like, there's a lot going on, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have a, I mean, it's fine. It's just, there's a lot. I mean, even someone for me who, like, remembers vaguely playing this game, like, 10 years before this, like, the, so imagine something like a, a top-down 2D Zelda, very heavily pixelated. I think like the actual kind of artistic design in this game is is a little charming, but it's just so overwhelming with there's just stuff everywhere and other players running around with all their different stuff that it it really just kind of yeah completely overwhelms your senses of like okay I've just started. 
like literally three seconds into this game there's like a dozen other like little people running around all like shooting magic bullets and they're not hurting me oh these must be friendly people okay yeah um, i mean it's it's all the chaos of a central hub in an mmo but without really the starter island where you have other noobs so you you go straight from like the super easy tutorial to uh everyone in full decked out here trying to trade items because there's no currency in this game so there's mm -hmm. only item trading everyone tr screaming about trying to trade items uh which i'm sure you can make sense of if you played the game but uh yeah I've, just running around spamming attacks that are don't do damage to you uh chaos chaos mode yeah basically um i will say however because it has that community element built in i, I had a great interaction when i just started the game where hmm. i don't really know what's going on I, I, I jumped into a quest and there's like 30 other people running around just like sprinting through the quest they all know what they're doing and i'm just like let me just like fire my you know you do the thing where you sh every everyone has the same ability, which is to shoot in one direction, like a thing, and mm -hmm. it just varies the damage it does, basically, with your skill. What but class like this guy's, were you? Were you a huh? wizard? I don't, I don't. I think it was the, I think it was a rogue this time. I wanted to mix it up a little bit, but there's um, no melee class in this game, right? I like literally doesn't. everything they is all a projectile. shoot bullets. Yeah, they all yeah. shoot projectiles. That's like the that's that's also I think a major shortcoming in my opinion because it's just like a si simple like sort of shooting out from a central point is like that's the skill i don't think that you could play this game as a melee character yeah because everything change, is just shooting you'd the, have to at change you the game same design because it is a bullet hell you yeah. would just get immediately eviscerated <laughs> but but someone gave me a really high level weapon early on and the is it feel, felt very diablo-esque in that sense where like hey yeah my level 99 character is going to come into your world and drop this loot which is like the maximum your character can have and i'm just like oh thank you and then suddenly like all these things that were hard i'm just like smashing through them and so there was that little small bit of delight and like this positive interaction between me and the stranger and we paired up together for a little while and we ran around and he showed me how to do some things. And then I lost interest completely because it wasn't fun, actually. <laughs> but it was it was a nice little moment. And uh -huh. I can see that maybe if someone was more into that, there's maybe a, something, not quite a game there, but there's sure. an experience. I felt, I don't know. I, I mean, I played it for longer than I expected. And I, I wanted to i don't know i i did feel like i got into a like a little bit of a zen state or just you know i was just running around shooting things for a while and that was not it wasn't bad um like i i, I feel like it didn't have a lot of depth though like mm -hmm. you didn't really i kept waiting for you to like get a different upgrade weapon that did different things or uh you know i i mean the next game we're going to talk about is basically like a diablo-esque game and i'm right. waiting for it to become that for you to be like i played as a wizard and like okay i had like the little weenie blast and i had like the big exploding blast and that's it you don't mm -hmm. get more than that uh, yeah the central i think conceit of this game is that like all mmos you run out into the world you find some um, some quest marker, you blow up some big monster, you get experience and new items, and you just like grind that treadmill until you have some some level of you know high level gear that you're ready to go and take on the uh, the mad god himself, Oryx. Uh, where as far like I've never gotten that far, but all the videos that I found of like people just going and it's just like this huge tidal wave of little pixelated characters shooting out just this like like screensaver jumbled mess of dots and dashes at this boss who like falls over and then i guess that's it like that's the end of the game but like there's other stuff to do about like you know there's other like end game dungeons you know beating oryx i guess is kind of like the main uh, central draw like you know oh you got to go and you know defeat the evil overlord like that that's a good enough hook i i feel like but like there and i will give it credit there is there is 
interesting elements of like just how wacky it is where you're just running around and then there's like oh my god there's like a thousand sand crabs just like chasing me and i have to like backpedal and like you know kite them from a distance and, and continuously shoot them fun but i don't know if it's more than like 25 minutes worth of fun at least for me i put three hours into it and i went i stopped playing because i went to bed so not because i was i was like okay i have to stop playing mm -hmm. so there was at least some amount of like drive to continue playing from yeah. from me uh like it it has a lot of things that i i'm moderately into in games uh i just don't think it was it didn't expand on them enough like i felt like i had plumbed the depths of the gameplay after three hours mm -hmm. and maybe that's not entirely true i know that there are different characters but so then i you know i eventually died when i fought some i don't think it was or himself i think it was a mini boss but then i played as an archer after the wizard Wait, and do like, you, lose, you lose everything in this game right like so if you played the game for 100 hours... I, and I believe have... this is a permadeath game, yeah. So yeah. if you uh, die... There's, there's like you... a treasury that you can put stuff in, so you can get... There's like a little pro little progress between the two, and you gain renown, and you can get like higher level characters. So there is like some right. minor level of like character progression. Um, but I played as an archer in the next one, and it was like, oh, cool. It's just like the same thing. It's a, uh, you know, left click, shoot small beam this time it's an arrow instead of a magic missile uh and right click is a power up that's also a projectile weapon that's just more powerful it's like that's not really different and there's just not that much going on like i i it's it's like a it's a bullet hell mmo which is mm -hmm. that is like the draw but it was not i just wanted more stuff i just wanted to be able to do more different things well the thing is you have to form the the guild and the i don't know i actually have right no idea. <laughs> that's not for me i'm not <laughs> into that stuff i but feel like, like this game would be like really really optimal for like a five to ten person land party where like everyone's on the same room oh, yeah there's yeah, yeah. like the whack like you can experience the wackiness together in the same area but like i feel like any anything more than that just kind of dilutes the experience so like working cooperatively with people would be fun but yeah i feel like there's a little bit a lack of depth about like in your standard mmos like wow and stuff you know you have other people doing like support abilities i don't think there's anything in you know support wise in this game other than just like shoot more uh but i uh, could definitely yeah so i'm watching i'm watching the fight against uh, the mad god in fight for oryx three currently the hardest boss in realm of mad god exalt and like this actually looks like a better game at and maybe if you're when you're fighting the mad god himself like it's it's a better bullet hell because it's just, it it's like it's got the thing that makes bullet hells good it's mm -hmm. got the the like crazy amounts of stuff but in predictable patterns so it's, it's that pattern recognition of like okay how do you how do you interpret where these two arcs are going to come together and you have to be in the one spot so they don't hit you uh oh, oh no there's the things that are lighting up on the ground you got to move around like that's that 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 triggers the like fun bullet hell pattern recognition mm -hmm. um the low level adventuring didn't quite get that it was too many mobs to to form coherent patterns uh so it is just being like shoot at a rabbit or whatever well let's jump into our our final game of the evening uh din's curse developed by soldak entertainment uh this was released august 22nd 2012 uh this i think is only available on windows um this comes in at the 836th most popular uh, game in the roguelike pantheon with uh, only 200-ish reviews and the 74th percent, uh, percentile. Uh, and this is, like we kind of described before, more kind of like your sort of traditional um, Diablo-like game, a 3D or a third person running around hack and slash, uh, hack and slash type game. And, and I think this is the first instance that we've seen 
on this show, we'll see more instances of this, but of something that uh, ironically is more kind of tied to the very traditional upbringings of like the rogue genre from the from the early 80s, where very simple, you have a town, you have a dungeon, you go in the dungeon, you fight monsters, and your goal is to save the town. Like, that's like, literally, it does what it says on the tin. Like, that's all that it is. Um, it should be worth noting that so this game came out August 2012, May 2013 is when Diablo 3 released. So <laughs> bad timing then, eh? Well, I mean, uh, to their credit, you know, they did release it before Diablo 3. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine a lot of people were were sort of waiting, waiting for Diablo 3 to come around. But this actually like had a pretty decent amount of hype for it at the time. Um, so a little bit about the, uh, the developers developed and published by Soldak Entertainment. Uh, 2004, uh, Soldak was started by Steven Peeler, who is the former technical director of Ritual Entertainment. You might remember them from the game Sin, which I, that's another game that like, I feel like I know off the top of my tongue, but I don't think I've ever played before, but they've also done Legacy of Kane Defiance and Counter-Strike Condition Zero. Um, some other other big ones there. Uh, their first standalone title was Depths of Peril, another kind of hack and slash, but less roguelike-y. Um, we have 2012 with Din's Curse, and then 2012, I think the same year, was their, their first spaceship RPG game, Jirox Operative, which actually looks kind of interesting. Uh, 2016, they developed a another hack and slash, a zombie, Zomba site. Uh, they followed up with a a a sequel to this game called Din's Legacy in 2019, another hack and slash, and Drox Operative 2 in 2021. So they've been they've been pulling out a pretty decent amount of content pretty consistently. Um, there is a DLC for Din's Curse called uh, Din's Curse Demon War, which is supposed to add more stuff, more another new character class for the Demon Hunter, more NPCs, world modifiers, environments, and, and so forth uh, that you can routinely find for like a dollar. Um, but as as we'll probably get into it, uh, you know, there, there's already kind of a lot of stuff in here. Um, Soldak Entertainment is basically just Steven Peeler uh, acting as the sole designer and programmer with his wife Delilah providing all the stories to the game. Um, and they say that uh, a major draw for this game is the world dynamism. Like there's a lot of interacting elements. There's a lot of, um, well, A, there's a lot of stuff in this game, but all that stuff is constantly working with each other. Uh, they say that, you know, monsters can get into fights with each other and even go to war with one another. Uh, they say if if Tuzon the Lich threatens to attack the town, sooner or later he will, unless you go and kill him first. Uh, when he does, you better be quick because NPCs in the main town can die. Uh, if something like a darkness machine uh, is going to cause an NPC to go broke, sooner or later that will happen. So you got to go and hunt down that darkness machine. Um, and I think that like the the hype for this game was really like the very independent nature of it the procedural generation at this time like was very localized to kind of like um 2d environments and at a smaller scale and this one i think being at the scale that it is was something that caught a lot of people's eye um but the story to this game is very simple it is you spawn in a town there is a, a 10 foot tall glowing monster who introduces himself by saying, I am the god Din. Though you have served no god in your pathetic, despicable life, I have offered you redemption through service to me. And that's it. Is that, is that the, that's the only voice line in the whole thing, right? No, there's, there's one other uh, voice line as far as I found also by the god Din that if oh. you just like, if you just cycle through like the talk button like a dozen times, he'll say, greetings, mortal. Okay, that's good. I oh, there you that. go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I am that a big fan being able to click enough times to give them the alternative dialogue a la, like, Warcraft or Starcraft or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so this is your kind of standard Diablo-like game. Uh, you, you pick character classes like paladins, sorcerers, wizards, uh, and they all have uh, subclasses to them. Um, a major draw to this is like how many 
class combinations you can make. So you can pick from like your standard, like, you know, wizard, fighter, barbarian classes and all that. And they might have like subclasses like um, fire mage spells or ice mage spells. And you can pick individually from those. So you, you could either go ham and just go all in on the ice mage spells or whatever. Um, or you could do like a couple of ice mage and you could like dual class with like a necromancer class and then like raise some skeletons from that um, and get like the best of both worlds for that. Um, but I don't know that that really works in this game's favor. What do you know that? Well, like the first character that I made, I tried doing something crazy. Be like, okay, I'm going to do a um, necromancer or uh, I think it was like a necromancer and like summoner kind of build. That was exactly I, what I started with. I wanted to be the most passive, like sit way <laughs> back and uh -huh. let my minions do my bidding. Does yeah, that does not work is my lesson learned. Right. Um, I think like I was I was very uh meh on this game to start with. I was mm -hmm. I was very um kind of taken aback at how limited like inventory slots were, how limited um like various like body slots were. I was kind of irritated at the fact that I picked up like things and I like literally can't use like 90% of what I picked up because like, oh, you don't, like, you picked up leather footwear. I'm like, okay, great. Equip, please. Oh, sorry, you don't know how to equip leather footwear. Yeah, Wait, what? I, didn't, I didn't like that you couldn't, like, uh, not being able to wear, wear mail. Okay. Not being able to wear leather feels a little weird, even though I am, like. Yeah, buckles are wizard. hard, man. You know, you have to be able to, like, put one, like, of the leather straps into the, uh, it's just way too complicated. But I think it, what. It doesn't make any sense. I think what grew on me with this was like, I'm like, okay, I can see that I'm not going to be using leather stuff because maybe that's reserved for more kind of like lighter armor classes or whatever. Uh, so as soon as I came across like leather stuff, I'm like, okay, I'll great. I'll just take this stuff back up to town to sell. Um, and I think the more that I kind of like focused on like one sort of specific thing, like, okay, I'm just going to go an ice mage. I'm just going to freeze everybody. That I think started to to like make a little more sense. And like I think just the the more that I ran around and started like beating on like these horribly politic polygonal monsters, it kind of grew on me a little bit. I think like the more the more like goofy encounters I, I came across, the more that I'm like, okay, yeah, this has like its own kind of specific charm to it. Um, it should be noted that, you know, you start in, in the town and there's just like this, you know, gate to, uh, the dungeon that's just right in town and you go and talk to various NPCs around in town. And I was a little, also a little disappointed that they, none of them really had anything interesting to say. They're like, Oh, did you know that some other NPC loves apples? I'm like, okay, great. Don't really care. Uh, how does this matter? Really anything? Um, but you you go into or you talk to the the NPCs in town and they'll give you a quest. <laughs> and another thing that like kind of frustrated me at the start of this game where I'm like, oh, this is just going to be a slog, isn't it? Like, I really wanted to like this. I had thought about making this its own independent episode, but I was like, oh, I don't know that there's enough meat here. We might just have to bundle it with another one um, that this is like fetch quest the game. Yes. Every every quest you get in this is some spin on you have to go and kill six skeletons on the third floor of the dungeon. Yep. Or one. It's all very particular skeleton. about. Or one, okay. yeah. And like if if you know Larry the super skeleton is not dealt with soon, like terror is gonna befall the town. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. Um so at first I was I was pretty dismissive of like the inventory, the limited nature of it and all this stuff. And, uh, but like the more that I was getting through the dungeon, then the more I'm like, huh, this is kind of interesting. Each floor of the dungeon has like its own specific go back to town teleporter. So you don't have to like burn town portal scrolls or anything like you would in a, a standard Diablo game. And it's, it makes it kind of like an interesting puzzle to hunt around through the level to find that gate to go back to town. And then, you know, come back into the gate and find, okay, where's that objective that I was hunting for before? And you get 
sort of into a flow state of like, okay, I've killed like five of those skeletons. I got to go find and kill that stupid sixth one in order to complete this quest and turn it in. Uh, and the I think the first character I made that necromancer summoner, I had uh, titled Sauron just for fun sake. And I had completed enough quests for the townsfolk that they had erected a statue to, to Sauron in the town square. I'm like, okay, like that's kind of funny. Uh but I didn't know, realize just, from your screenshot that that was based on your character name and not just like the in-game <laughs> sort of lore or reference to that uh, Lord of the Rings. That's great. That, that also would have been funny. But uh, but yeah, I wound up uh, changing through a bunch of different character classes. Be like, okay, how does this character play to compared to this one? Um, I didn't. I really didn't like the melee class at all. But I found uh, like the the ice mage who I who I had nicknamed Frozone. Uh, <laughs> A female ice mage that was running around through the dungeon, just like blasting everybody. I got a lot of good joy out of that. But yeah, like the so all of the the dungeon, um, I guess skins textures to them uh, are different each time. So like you start up a new world and it might be a gothic theme, or you start up a new world and it might be like just a cave theme or something like that. Um, very simplistic. You just go floor to floor, mashing mobsters. But like they there's like a weirdly like fun element of like these you know giant spiders attacking giant uh there's like leprechauns in the game that will steal your gold and one of my mission objectives was to go and kill the super leprechaun and he had oh god it's gonna kill me that i don't remember this but he was i was running around trying to hunt them and he's like got your gold matey <laughs> and i was just like really motivated to just beat the shit out of the stupid leprechaun yeah leprechauns were the worst i mean they were delightful to kill but they like, fuck you, come back here. <laughs> you stole like all my money. Uh, I encountered them when I was under leveled for the floor I was on. So it was like an actual difficult quest to get the one that ran away. Uh, I was like fighting through hordes of other enemies trying to get the fucking leprechaun. What is it in Diablo 2 or Diablo 3? Like, it, 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 there's a specific. Uh, oh, you're right. One of those things. The imp the um no the um he tried to run away the goblin the something goblin no i i'm blanking here there's some money goblin yeah that tries to steal your cash you right know, and so that's that's why that's why like that was the same thing for me the leprechaun versus this other like diablo thing is like this game is just a bad diablo 2 and like I, I played this game for like way longer than I expected because mm-hmm, I thought mm-hmm. like it kept engaging me with like oh okay there's more content yeah. here and there and the content just slowly unlocks and so you're like oh I now I understand like why I would choose you know this set of like skills versus this set like it actually makes a difference yeah. but ultimately uh yeah it's hard to really like, there's not like a long term narrative it's not like you're trying to again with this whole narrative thing like Diablo you're like your goal is to defeat the defeat hell essentially and like you're <laughs> like or defeat diablo right and like you, uh-huh. you you know partner with heaven or somewhat and there's like this whole like kind of like a very a biblical religious undertone yeah exactly yeah. but this game is just like yeah there's some bad thing it's evil it's just hey by the way black you've been white. cursed you're cursed yeah, it, it's black and white it's just like a and here's the bad guy and you're the good guy and then like the one thing it had which was different i think the the, the most notable i should say was that Things would come into your town, like mm-hmm. and attack them. Yeah. Actually, that happened in Diablo, if I recall correctly. They, they, they happened in kind of cutscene, sort of like things where you enter town, things were on fire, and then things would attack you, and like, oh, but this was just like, a, oh, well, the here's time a random. Sen- it, it was time sensitive, so it was yeah, like, it was okay, stupid. this thing's happening. What? Oh, you didn't like that? Not at all. I thought it was just a gimmick that, like, just immediately was absorbed as a, oh, this is. Oh, here's that sound again. The sound of the trumpets. The sound of the, yeah. that means that like you have to go back to town because otherwise a bunch mm-hmm. of people are gonna die and you have to save them. And it's just yeah. like, oh well, I'm trying to find this gate, but my strategic decision now is: do I pr- press forward and let people die, or do I go back? What happens That's if you the let whole strategy everyone die? Uh, I and this was another thing that I thought was like, oh yeah, I wonder like if there's any sort of consequence to having like the armor smith die or the gambler die or something. As far as I could tell, like they die and then like they're basically just replaced by other people who just wander into town and at, exactly. after a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that there's like the only thing that I could see it being a major issue is if you have a bunch of quests from a specific NPC 
and then the town gets invaded and that NPC dies and you can't turn your quest back in, yep. then uh, yeah, but I think that's the only thing that could that could impact that. Oh, uh, you lost some experience. Well, that's yeah. too bad. Uh, the thing that I so I I like the idea of being a, like here is a quest, a time sensitive like there is a a literal ticking clock you have to go do it. Um, but a lot of them. I felt like we're like, oh no, there's a thing on level seven. It was like, I'm on level like three. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not that I'm choosing not to do this quest, it's that I am unable to do it yet. So there were, and there was just, it wasn't branching. It was just like, go from level one to level seven or whatever. So there was no, there were a lot of times there's like, it wasn't that I was making a choice not to do this yet. It was that I was, you just physically couldn't do it yet. Yeah, it's just like get good before this happens. Mm -hmm. So it's not a it's like I want to be able to make interesting choices in the games that I'm playing. Yeah. And sometimes like I felt like the interesting choices that I got in this game were what your skill upgrades were. Yeah. Upgrading um, is the only interesting thing. And the playing the game and let me I guess the like the other decisions were like I you know do I spam the one that does AOE damage or the one that does single target damage? Do I use some of my mana on a protection spell or something else? Um, like the, it was a pretty good Diablo roguelike. I felt like it was by far the most roguelike of the games that we played that what, my, minus the like, maybe Dungeons of Dread War, which. Mm -hmm. you know, There's like, no permadeath here though. That was the main thing. That's why I'd say that this almost disqualified itself. I don't remember if yeah. there is a permadeath option, but there there is. But there's there's like a bunch of options. Okay. Default was not. Yeah. The default was not. No. Um. I know that there's. Yeah, like it's it's the most work like in the way that the dungeons are generated. Mm -hmm. Like felt like true random dungeon generation and it's the first one i think that we've played so far that i felt like the generations of the dungeon wasn't like a good use of procedural generation hmm. like some of the other ones we played uh cargo commander procedural for the fact of being procedural didn't feel like it added anything um versus this is like yeah, these sprawling cavern underground things um, being a, a hand design level would not have made it any better mm -hmm. uh, without having like put a lot more work into it. Um, so like I, if I'm going to have my games have procedural generation, I want there to be a reason for it. Yeah. Uh, and like some of the reason can be it's easier. You don't have to like hand place all your assets, but if you're just doing it to say that you've done it, eh, then do it for me. That way you get the, the roguelike tag in Steam and everyone downloads their game because, you know, everyone wants to play roguelike games. In 2012, I don't know if that was an actual draw yet. Yeah, probably not. But it's probably leaning more on Diablo. I mean, almost a certain Yeah, it's a Diablo esque. Game. It's, yeah. And, and it's... I think it was a, a my really good. Diablo-esque game. In my view, it was the best of the three we played, which isn't saying much, to be fair. <laughs> but well, let's uh, that's a good transition spot. Let's move on to the uh, the overall rankings here. So on each episode, we're we're doing our best to try to wrangle all of these uh, top one hundred ish games that over the past decade. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I. I'm going to probably like buck the trend a little bit here based on the tea leaves that I'm reading. Um, I kind of liked Cargo Commander a lot. Uh, I think this is my new number three game, uh, just above Out of Pineapple what? Smash just Crew, know. just behind Dungeons of Dreadmore. Um, I thought, I thought like it's, it doesn't have a lot of staying power. And I think that's okay because I think what it has going for it in the time that you can enjoy like most of it is pretty pretty well feature complete i don't like the the base like nail gun that you have at all and i think the game kind of suffers drastically from like the base gun that you have as being very bad 
I think maybe it adds to some strategic decision making like, oh, okay, I, I have to use a different gun. So I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to do so. But I really like the, um, I think the theme of like corporate drudgery works really well for it. Um, I don't know that it's something very inspiring to play. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think like, I think number three sits right for me at the moment. Uh, Din's Curse, I'm going to slap in at my new number five just behind Pineapple Smash Crew and above Hack Slash Loot. I, I thought this was, this grew on me the more that I played with it. I It was, I think, repulsive the first five minutes that I played with it. I'm like, oh my God, this is, the UI is awful. The inventory is dreadful. Uh, oh, but these skills look interesting. Oh, huh, this is kind of fun. And like, it just kind of like building on from there, inch by inch. Um, I did... I did like finally save the town in Din's Curse by going and completing some objective. It doesn't actually tell you which objective is the one that will save the town, which is kind of frustrating because you're like, uh, so which one of these is the most important? But I got like the little confetti sparkler saying, congratulations, you saved the town. I'm like, okay, great. Uh, now what? And then I hit the you know proceed button and it just sends you to another town and Din is still there and I'm still cursed. Is the curse that I'm just supposed to repeat this until the end of time? Like I get, I get to keep your character and, you know, all the skills attached to it, but like, I don't know that, that kind of like, if it even just like rolled credits on it, I think that may have been more interesting, but I, I had more fun with Din's curse than I thought I would. That being said, I think realm of the mad God is 100% not for me. Uh, I can see how some people would find it fun and interesting, but Ugh, yeah, I don't know that I'm really that target demographic. So for me, it's my new bottom game. Uh, I keep looking through like our schedule list of like, okay, what other games are we going to play? Like, is anything going to like really kick it off that bottom list? And I guess we'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, my it's my new number nine game at the moment, but we'll see how those rankings shape up. I guess On? I'll go next. Yeah. Uh... Dens is my new number two. Wow. Wow. I, I mean, think, not 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 super wow, but okay. Okay. I mean, and I feel like, yeah, I don't know. It's a fun game. Uh, I feel like, it, I didn't say like Pineapple Smash Crew was the new number, or was the old number two for me. That one was like a fun game that was like uh, a tasty treat, uh, like a little, uh, like a like the candy that you get at the end of a, of a meal at a Mexican restaurant. Um, but like no depth to it at all. Uh, Din's Curse felt like just a moderately fun game um, that I could just play. Uh, Cargo Commander, uh, my new number seven out of eight, didn't like it, didn't really enjoy it. Uh, and then Realm of the Mad Gods, just one step above at uh, number six. So uh, I, Feel like i'm kind of in the same boat as you scott where like i can see the appeal and i can see even a version of myself liking it more if i was going to get into the mmo part of it mm -hmm. but playing it at, like playing it without engaging in the mmo aspect is not a good game playing it with the mmo aspect it could be a good game but i'm just not at a point in my life where i'm looking to play an mmo of any sort let alone one that's 10 years old and not the I the best one. Like I could I could pick uh, an MMO and maybe play one. And like you have to invest a lot of time. Um there is one thing about it that I forgot. I did look through some of the ratings and it has my favorite thing of all, like all things that related to Steam, which is negative reviews from someone who's played the game for 9,000 hours. Uh just fucking love that shit. I love, I love it. And people are like, I have put in 9,000 hours in this game and I just cannot recommend it. Like, I don't know, man. I feel like your actions are speaking <laughs> much louder than your words. Obviously, you can. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to put in 9,000 hours. No. Just, just, yeah. I guess it leaves me. Um, 
I have a different sort of way of thinking about this thing. I, I can't just do a ranking, right? Because like, in order to ranking something, I have to think about like, what is it relative to? And so I do a score, I convert that to rank. And so, and I never recommend a game that's below a seven in my one to 10 kind of score. And so for these games, for Cargo Commander, uh, actually, I guess I'm going to start from the, the lowest. Realm of the Mad God, I give a 2.5 out of 10, which... <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Which for my rankings is equivalent to seven out of the eight games I played because I didn't actually do Binding of Isaac, the Flash version. So I only have eight instead of the Scots nine. Um, eighth place was a Valley Without Wind, which I give two out of 10. So, so that's kind of like, that's the bottom level layer that we've, we've, we've hit so far. Um, yeah, Realm of the Mag, like maybe for, if I was maybe 12 years old and games didn't exist that do nowadays and like what i'm looking at is like literally the games that exist when i'm 12 years old maybe that's a fun game but no it's not for me as an adult um cargo commander i give a three a point five more <laughs> than <laughs> a three out of ten which what's it at number five on my out of eight list i just don't i don't really love like kind of side scroller sort of mario s sort of like i know you Scott, you really love like Super Meat Boy and like those kind of games. I just, uh, Noita, like I can understand it. I've tried them. I just can't get into those ones as much. So um, that one didn't do so well for me. And Din's Curse um, at 4.5 out of 10 gets it the number three ranking um, out of the nine or of the eight games I've played. Um, it was the best of the ones we did. I, I put six hours in that game. I, I, I think I absorbed all the novelty there was in those six hours. Um, and, uh, yeah, the only game that I would recommend that at 7.5 out of 10, my number one game is Binding of Isaac Rebirth. Everything else we've played so far, it's been a learning experience and now I get to appreciate <laughs> what I love about games, but these are not games I can recommend. So that's where we are in what, 2012? Is that where we're at right now? Yes. We're, uh, we're just coming up towards the end of our 2012 games, uh, the algorithm has been gracious uh, oh, has. to, to bless one. us with the uh, with the hammer for the end of 2012 uh, and our our next episode, uh, which will be FTL Faster Than Light by Subset Games. Um, I think that one will be a good a good palate cleanser. We'll have a, an actual fully dedicated episode to it. Um, and yeah, I think uh, that that'll close us out for our 2012 games, just in time for us to start kicking off our uh, our 2013 games. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I, having played a little bit of uh, FTL and also having played Into the Breach, the other ga game they pl they uh, created. Oh man, I I know I love this uh, this uh, game creator, and I'm expecting that this takes the, the top spot, but we'll see. A strong contender for the number one. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that's going to close out our uh, our bundle episode here on Cargo Commander, Din's Curse, and Realm of the Mad God. Uh, we'll see you guys next time for Faster Than Light. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>